Welcome to this episode of the B2B Revenue Leadership Podcast. This week, we've got a great topic. How do you win against Goliath companies, the biggest of the big, the Oracles, the IBMs, the SAPs, all of these huge companies out there in this very crowded space of analytics and business intelligence? This week, I have the CRO of Anaplan talking about how he did it and the unique way that he took to do it. Pretty much the opposite of what everyone else does. Everyone else is trying to turn in the high velocity sales machine, but sometimes we don't have high velocity businesses. Sometimes we have enterprise businesses that take a while to build. And that once you're in, you've got the license to hunt, as he says. I really enjoyed this interview. We have a very similar background. It was very interesting. I love talking to him. Also, if, if you like to be on the show, just contact me. Join me up at LinkedIn. Just connect with me and send me an email. Love to have sales and marketing leaders as well as CEOs of the hottest companies out there. Share your story. Share it with the largest C-level audience in the world. We're up in the top 20 of iTunes. We hit the top 100 podcasts of all iTunes. Everyone loves to hear about what other people are doing to succeed and the lessons they've learned along the way. Way. Hard earned lessons. But before we get into the interview, I want to make sure you're checking out Prezi.com. Make sure you do this. You got a free ebook. Now check it out, Prezi.com. This is the way I'm telling stories now. It's so much better than presentations. I've got a class coming up at January 1st on how to start the conversation and get the meeting. Whether you're in marketing or sales, there's a new thing called outbound sales that is done by human beings. I can show you how I'm doing it <laughs> pennies on the dollar. So much, like one-tenth the cost of these SDRs that you have using both technology and people. And in a way that I'm getting 80% open rates and 60% response rates. It's insane. So stay in touch with me. Connect up with me. Brian Burns on LinkedIn. Let's get into the interview. Listen to the very end. I'm going to sum it up and tell you what I'm up to. Here we go. Hey, Paul. Thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, Brian, thank you. Uh, I've been here um, at Anaplan a little over two years, uh, but spent pretty much the last 30 plus years in enterprise software. Uh, starting out in Philadelphia, I was um, uh, right out of college at ADP, which was a great training ground for salespeople. And back in 1983, they actually used to invest in, in a lot of sales training back then. And ADP was a great uh, first company to work for. And then uh, I was pretty lucky. And I always say in sales, it's better to be lucky than good. Um, <laughs> I was living in Philly and there was a small German company called Systems Application and Products and Data Processing that had about 50 people in Philadelphia. And um, I was one of the first employees. And obviously that company was SAP or now SAP. So it was spent a good part of my career there through the uh, startup through growth phases. And so it was a pretty interesting uh, opportunity to, to, you know, work with some of the world's largest companies on these big re-engineering pro processes through the 90s. And then um, took a big risk, moved out here to the Valley in 1998, pre-revenue at a company called Ariba a business-to-business e-commerce firm, and um, spent probably about 15 years uh, on and off there uh, until we sold it to SAP in, um, in 2012. Did some private equity work at a company called iPipeline, an uh, insurance software company, and then uh, ended up back here in the Valley, second tour of duty, moved back out here two years ago for Anaplane. Nice. And I, that must have been a big contrast between ADP and SAP. Yeah, I'll tell you, ADP was great. I remember my early sales days. I had North Philly territory, which is a pretty rough neighborhood. And, um, you know, there were a couple of times where I came out of the appointment and I didn't have a car. So, <laughs> you know, going from that, uh, selling to small and light manufacturing companies and, and small service companies in, in the inner city to uh, selling to Fortune 5 companies was uh, definitely a contrast, that's for sure. And t tell us the Anaplan story. You know, what wow, what was your motivation for going there? I, when you showed up, what did it look like? Yeah, it's it's a really interesting story. I mean, I, I kind of thought I was, you know, going to kind of hang it up after all these years in enterprise software. And then I got a call from, you know, my former boss who was on the board here. And he says, hey, I want you to take a look at this company, Anaplan. And, and I had never heard of it, honestly. And being in technology, I probably should have. But the more I looked under the covers, Brian, it, it, it just became pretty evident that there was something special going on here. So I came out, you know, interviewed and just felt an amazing buzz at the company. Uh, you know, just a real high IQ, a lot of young talent uh, and a lot of energy. And I was like, what is going on here that is so different? And then I realized pretty quickly the disruptive nature 
of Anaplan. I mean, it is a analytics and planning platform, and I think it's different in other platforms. There's millions of these different point solutions for analytics and, and planning, uh, but it's a connected platform, and they're the two things that differentiate it from really the dozens of other companies that, that are in this space. And what's unique about it is, you know, when the founder, Michael Gould, started the company actually in a barn outside of London in a place called York. So it's got a great, you know, beginning. Uh, he had worked at a company called the Datum, which was bought by Cognos, which was bought by IBM. At the same time that was happening, companies like Outlook Soft and Business Objects were bought by SAP, Arborsoft, by Hyperion, bought by Oracle. So in 2007 or so, 2008, all innovation in our space basically stopped when the big three did those major acquisitions. And Michael went to the folks at IBM and said, hey, I can build a connected planning and analytics platform. I can make it scalable. I can build it in memory. I can put it in the cloud. I can make it business friendly. All these amazing things. And of course, IBM said, no, nah, we're just going to put a new user interface on the <laughs> That's the what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of like the wine, you know, when I... I was at college, we used to put the cheap wine into the into the fancy bottles. That's kind of what these guys do. Right? So, uh, so luckily, Michael got off on his own, spent three years literally in the barn building the engine, and then came out here, of course, couldn't get money in, in London or in Europe, came out here to Silicon Valley, uh, raised some money, and the rest is really history. And what did the sales organization look like when you showed up? Yeah, you know, uh, I got here, you know, we had – you know, kind of, it wasn't really a startup. It was kind of a tweener, which is, you know, kind of a good situation for me, right? I think, yeah. you know, my many years in sales and sales experience, my goal is to get something that's already kind of baked, but needs to get to the next level and, and you know, pour the gasoline on it. And so that's really what it looked like here. We had a, a good core group of, uh, of sales folks. The profile was a little different. We had hired a lot of uh, people from the enterprise performance management space, um, which uh, really was a little different profile than what we do here at Anaplan. So those folks primarily worked at the big three company. Uh, they had experience in financial planning, but they really didn't understand what Anaplan was as a platform across the enterprise. So what we're unique about, Brian, is that we not only sell to the finance folks or the office of CFO, uh, but we're selling to the office of the CRO, we're selling to the head of marketing, we're selling to the head of manufacturing, logistics, supply chain, because planning is really across an enterprise. So if you think about here in the Valley, you know, most of the large technology firms with, you know, 20, 30,000 sales reps use Anaplan to deal with all of their account segmentation, their territory quota management incentive comp, all that stuff was done primarily, even at the world's largest companies, HP, Cisco, Adobe, VMware, on spreadsheets. And you know sales today, it's, it was maybe an art when I started selling back in the 80s, but it is absolutely a science today. And if you don't know what you're paying your people, you don't know what accounts they're running with, you have unbalanced territories, uh, you know, you're know you going to be in a, in a really tough uh, situation from a sales productivity perspective. And if you look at some of the results some of our customers are having with the impact on sales productivity – uh, by putting Anaplan on the front end of the business, amazing. And then if you kind of walk through your house, you go through your pantry, you go in your garage, uh, you go in your wife's closet, uh, you know, I can assure you that most of the products, the goods, the services that, you know, uh, most of the consumer product goods and retail companies, uh, cosmetic companies, uh, all using Anaplan to run their supply chain. And then, of course, the traditional finance component of it. So, bringing in salespeople that just know how to sell to the finance person was a big shift for us. And so people who really knew how to navigate across an enterprise uh, became the profile of the reps we have now. So it sounds like it was a lot more like SAP than it was uh, ADP. <laughs> yes. You know, and, you know, our client base is varied. I mean, our product could go into small and mid-sized firms. Yeah. However, the majority of our customers tend to be fortune enterprises. The more complex, uh, the larger the scale, uh, that's really where Anaplan differentiates itself from these literally, you know, other platforms that have been around 20, 25 years. So it sounds like it's a very complex sale. Is that true? Yeah, it is difficult because you think about trying to navigate a Fortune 50 organization 
first of all, they don't even know what they're doing yep. within a lot of different silos of the business, the different regions. A lot of times they'll come to our account reps and try to find out what's going on in their own companies. So yes, it is complex selling to large enterprises. And um, no, that's why we have the type of profile uh, of account rep that we have that you know, has a very high IQ, very independent, uh, you know, don't take no for an answer because if you go into finance, they're not ready to buy it. You can go to supply chain, you can go to sales, you go to marketing, you go in the IT group. Uh, the beauty is our product planning is everywhere in an organization and almost everyone has an opportunity to use our pro- platform. And so where do the reps typically start? You know, let's say into, into a cold account, they, they get the territory, mm-hmm. they've got little to no mm-hmm. leads probably, or, you know, you know what it's like. Yeah, the big yeah, quota. Yeah, yeah. Marketing guys never give us the leads, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you could go to trade shows and it's, you know, it's hard to understand like a company like yours exactly what does it do in, right. in under a minute. It's really hard. It really is. And I think, you know, you t- think about the different personas that we sell to. So if I'm talking to the CRO of a you know large company with 20,000 reps, it's pretty easy to talk to them about how they're managing territories, quotas, incentive compensation plans, sales productivity, sales forecasting, things that are very close to their uh, domain. But then if you talk to somebody in finance or in supply chain about that, they have no idea what you're talking about. So the beauty is at the very highest level of the organization, whether it's the CIO or the CFO, uh, they get the concept of how these things are so disparate in their current organization and how it's disconnected. And the amazing thing is, I call them boundary systems, but the world today, all the money that's been spent on ERP and you know CRM systems and HCM systems, billions, trillions of dollars, the reality is these are transaction-based systems the true decision making in organizations are done based upon information coming off of PowerPoint slides derived from models built in Excel yes. or point solutions. So, and that is not unique to any company. It Every is, Fortune is. company has this exact same problem, which would really would attract me to Anaplan is I wouldn't have got excited about replacing Oracle Hyperion or IBM's, you know, TM1 product. That that's not something that would have brought me back to California. But the fact that I can replace boundary systems, literally hundreds of them, thousands of them in these fortune companies that are point solutions in supply chain or sales or marketing or in finance uh, with a platform like Anaplan is truly revolutionary and incredibly disruptive. Well, that's it. And I I don't think a lot of people really understand that today because, you know, I work through an acquisition at a you know, one of the largest companies and they had all of this crap, I mean, stuff, <laughs> enterprise software. And it, you know, and all of a sudden every Monday they, they mailed out the, the forecast and a spreadsheet, you know, <laughs> you, you know, the problem, Brian. Right. And, and all of a sudden, you know, and you know, everyone said, oh, it was based off the CRM. It had nothing to do with the CRM. <laughs> you know, it was it was just this roll up of, you know, spreadsheets. And oh, what a nightmare. And could you imagine running a fortune company today? Uh, it's kind of like driving a car, right? You're, you're trying to drive the car. And, you know, a lot of the BI tools and the, the, the things that have helped, you know, the tableaus are great products. Uh, in fact, a great customer of ours and we use their product. It's, it's good at looking at what happened, yeah. right? So you can yeah. look in a rearview mirror, you know, hopefully it's not foggy anymore so you can see what happened behind you. The problem is you have to drive the car so much faster today and you need to know what's coming ahead, especially in today's world. I mean, you know, you look at companies like Amazon, you know, the, the industries that they're coming into. If, if you're sitting back waiting for something to happen, you know, winter's coming. In fact, it's almost here. So these companies need to react much quicker the macroeconomics environment, you know, is, is ever changing. So the fact that you can run these companies on series of disparate spreadsheets, those days are going to be over or you're going to wind up not being in the Fortune 500 anymore. There's a lot of those companies that are no longer in the Fortune 500. So it sounds like when you, when you showed up, you, you needed to hone the, the profile of, you know, the A player candidates for the reps and those are pretty, sounds like pretty much the classic enterprise software people. You know, Brian, that's what I thought, honestly, when I first got in here. And some of those folks, honestly, have lost their fastball. So they just couldn't adjust to 
this kind of a faster paced environment. Because yeah. if you're sitting at an SAP or an Oracle or an IBM, it really is almost a professional visitor's, visitor job in some of those accounts. They <laughs> have ELAs in place. They literally are just, you know, uh, supporting an existing infrastructure that's sitting there. And then what happened is all these cloud providers over the past 10 years, and obviously led by uh, Mark and Salesforce, you know, have come in through the side doors. And now the CIOs have literally a plethora of challenges to pull all this Humpty Dumpty back together. And, you know, you would think that the traditional enterprise software guy like myself would be the perfect profile. And some of them are, don't get me wrong. Uh, but we found that a lot of the kind of folks that come out of pre-sales or consulting yeah. Uh, yeah. have, you know, who have a good stage presence and, and, you know, you can almost teach them some of the basic selling skills, uh, but they truly understand business. They understand business processes. They understand business processes across an enterprise and they truly can become a trusted advisor in these large enterprises. And that seems to be a profile that is maybe unlike the traditional enterprise you know, software, you know, person that I hired at SAP back in the nineties. Well, uh, you know, I've consistently, and that, that's my background and that's how I got into sales. And I've seen that repeat itself because, I, you know, we, where you found things that were baked, I found things that weren't even in the oven yet. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and We were trying to put it together while the ovens open and, and get it cooked. Um, now, how about as far as the the sale being very technical, meaning like you you must have to connect to a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I mean the technical aspect of the sale is actually the easy part because um, there's ELT tools today like Informatica, MuleSoft, Snap, all these you know very sophisticated you know warehouse capabilities to get data back and forth from different places, right? Because I just mentioned over the past 10 years, they had these legacy infrastructure systems from SAP and Oracle, and then all these cloud systems came in because those systems weren't able to address all the needs of the business. All that stuff went out, um, you know, uh, to try to tie this all together. So then the ELT tools like MuleSoft and other became much more prevalent in these companies. So I think tying the data together is, is it's always a challenge. But I think that's less uh, part of the sale as the fact that you're really transforming the way these guys are doing the business, whether it's a new way of budgeting, like zero-based budgeting, a completely different approach to budgeting, rolling forecasts, things that are different in the way the business process works, right? So, you know, the sales and operations plan at, at a CPG company that traditionally has been bifurcated into multiple legacy systems now can be integrated into one planning engine on Anaplan, that really changes the role and responsibility of the workers, of the process, all the way through, whether it's sales, supply chain, or finance. So there's huge transformational aspects of our platform. So it's not really just the technical integration piece. It's more the new business process, the change management. And that, that's why, obviously, companies like Bain, McKinsey, BCG, Deloitte, Accenture like working with Anaplan, not because you have to screw a lot of software in and, and connect a bunch of pipes and data, but truly there's change management, business process reengineering uh, and transformation that's occurring, you know, whether it's a finance transformation, a supply chain transformation, a whole go to market transformation, all these are being enabled by our technology. So that's really the, the, the thing that, that sells it, not so much the technology itself. Okay. And when you showed up, where were deals getting stuck versus where are they getting stuck today? Or, you know, what, what I'm kind of trying to get at is, you know, given your experience, what were they not doing before you showed up? Yeah, I, I think it's not what they weren't doing. I think when you start realizing what it takes to uh, work with global companies and the level of expectation that they have uh, from companies like Anaplan, right? And I think that's where the startup, to the, you know, I don't know if you have teenage children, but like the tweeners and then to be a real company. So a lot of companies are startups. They never get to where we're at. And then a lot of companies where we're at never get to be the next Salesforce or Workday or ServiceNow because they don't make that transition to really get to these global companies and, and truly get into these companies and expand and become a critical component of their daily operations. And I think you know, a lot of companies sell point solutions. That's great. You know, we have a land and expand strategy. We get into a certain area, 
But the key is once you're in a large global company, how do you expand into other business units, other regions, uh, other divisions, other lines of business? If you're successful in doing that, now you become a critical fabric of the decision making of that global company. And that's when the deals start to accelerate and get much bigger. And that's what I see a lot of these high velocity companies not doing, that they're so transactional oriented, you know, that it then goes over to the customer success team and then the rep goes to find the, you know, the next thing to shoot. And, and I think that that skill that you described is kind of um, uh, almost extinct, you know, yeah. because of the new SaaS model. Yeah, the SaaS model, you're exactly right on there, Brian. SaaS models caused a lot of challenges that, in that if you think back in the old days, you sold a big, giant, perpetual deal. They're committed. They just spend 10, 20, 100 million dollars with the consulting firm. And then that sales rep is gone and there's no really need for that person to come back. Where with the SaaS model, even though our average, you know, 10 years, two plus years, almost three years, which is fantastic. The average SaaS deal is usually a year or less. Right. So you really have to once you're in, your selling never stops. And so a lot of times, a lot of companies are transaction oriented. The sales reps come in, the hunters come in, and then there's not a smooth transition to the farmer. Uh, and that's where a lot of companies fall apart. Our model's critical for customer success because we're coming into a division. We land in a certain area. But yeah, as I mentioned, our stuff is connected across the enterprise. If we're going to get and spread across the enterprise, we have to be successful, obviously, in that initial delivery, but more so in expanding and getting the adoption of the technology across multiple lines of business. That's when it becomes successful. And you're right. A lot of companies aren't geared to deal with the complexities of large companies and or they don't have the resources or the skill sets uh, to be able to service the demands of the fortune companies. And describe, you know, what that organization looks like, because that is not what a lot of people are used to. You know, do you have, um, you know, because what, let's say somebody closes, you know, a nice big account, you know, Fortune mm-hmm. 50 mm-hmm. account. How do you keep that rep incentivized, focused, and not distracted by the next shiny object? Yeah, so the, the nice thing about what we do, Brian, that next shiny object's already in front of you, yeah. right? So, if you, so you think about the hardest thing to sell in a Fortune company is to get through InfoSec, IT, and worst of all, procurement. Right. So you think about these large companies, they want less suppliers. They don't want a well, uh, you know, hundred new cloud suppliers at 500,000 a piece. They want a less suppliers makes their life and job easier. Getting through the security now, the cloud security at some of these fortune companies, it's literally, uh, I always say our, our time to get through security and procurement is usually twice the time that it takes to implement the stuff. So it's just, that's the reality. So once you're in as a rep, you now have a license to hunt within a fortune company. So you might land at a 50 to 100 to $150,000 transaction in a large company in a very small segment or line of business. Now your incentive is to, now that you've been through procurement, you've been through InfoSec, you've been through IT, you know, all those challenging things to become a new supplier. Now you hunt within that large enterprise. You literally can, you know, make your entire quota from one or two accounts. And what do you see people doing wrong today? You know, because I'm sure you're in the Valley, you talk to a lot Mm -hmm. of, um, you know, counterparts that are, you know, in, you know, high velocity companies that, you know, have a window of opportunity. What mistakes do you see people making? Yeah. And and I would say we all make the same mistakes, right? It's, it's, you look at the short term at the shiny object uh, at the next quarter, you know, we need to do the next fundraising round. I, I really think that the challenge here, and it's always been this way, and nothing's changed in the 25 years since I've been here, is a lot of people take a very short-term view uh, of the business. And that's that's a problem, right? It's a problem when you're dealing with customers, because if you really think about, you know, our whole approach at Anaplan is customer first, right? You think about the software companies that are out there today, especially the large ones, they're like the anti-customer first. When 45% of your revenue is done through audit and extortion, it's a really (laughs) tough um, way to be customer friendly. So we want to be opposite that. We want to, you know, partake in our our customer success. We want a value-based approach where the customer is getting value from our platform. 
I mean, these are things that are long term. That's why customers stay with you for years and continue to buy more. And that's the approach we want to take. And I think that's very different than the mentality in not all companies. There's some phenomenal examples of customer first companies. Uh, but I, I think for the most part, a lot of young companies fall into the quarterly trap or the next round of funding trap and and they lose sight of the long term picture. And unfortunately, they lose sight of the most important thing. And that's who's paying our bills. And that's the customer. And where do you see sales going, say, in the next five years? Sales as a profession or yeah, yeah. sales? Yes. I, mean, I, can't, I can't answer those questions. Uh, my CFO will kill me. Uh, <laughs> I know you're very focused on revenue. Yeah. yeah that's right. But I think, you know, not on a plan specific, but I think the selling profession uh, is dramatically changing. And it's been changing, but it's it's getting more, you know, I, I always use the word art and science. I mean, back pre-cell phones and you know, uh, pre-technology, uh, art was pretty much the, the the way sales was done. It was a relationship uh, profession. And not to say that the relationship isn't still important, because I think people still always buy from people. But there's so much science, so much AI, so much things that you can put into the selling motion in a company today to make it more efficient. And then you can start to, to fine tune those knobs, if you will, whether it's around compensation or territory or quota or, or the way you forecast or the way you go to market. I mean, these things are no longer gut feels or based on my experience. There's just so much data and science and, and best practices that you can start to leverage. And I think the companies that kind of just do it the way they've always done it uh, are going to struggle. Right. I mean, you know, think about the profile we talked about earlier, Brian. You know, I, I came in. The profile was what you would think the profile would be. And we were struggling, right? So we took a chance on a probably a very different profile that has been incredibly successful for us, right? So I think you gotta be willing to experiment, to try new things, to use data, be data driven around what you do, and, and think of what we do as a science and, and run it as an efficient operation, you know. And at the end of the day, it's still you know face to face and and relationships and all those things you know don't go away. But I think you just can't rely on just that anymore going forward. Great. Hey, for the, the executives that are listening that feel that Ataplan is a, a match for them, where should they go? They should just call me direct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cut cut out those reps. Huh? <laughs> House accounts. I got to commission myself, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> Christmas is coming up, right? There you go. It is Christmas time. Now, I think that, you know, for folks that are thinking about Ataplan, I mean, first of all, visit the website and look at the app exchange, or we, we call it uh, our app hub, uh, similar to like what Salesforce has as an app exchange, it, it shows you the breadth of our ecosystem and the type of things we're doing. So if you look at that, I think there's over 200 and some odd now that either we have built, our customers have built, our partners have built. It's just unbelievable. And then you also can look uh, at the stories that our customers tell. You know, we, we compete with some of the big three or four. They, they don't want to give their customer references because they don't have any, right? And everybody's throwing this stuff out. Um, you know, you go on our website, you see all these people, like almost a cult feeling, talking about how their operation has changed, how their life has changed, how their profession has changed because of this tool set and this platform has dramatically changed the way people operate. Those stories are just phenomenal stories. I mean, look, don't get me wrong, we're not saving the world or anything, but when we take uh, this platform and put it into these large organizations and take people from their mundane tasks of entering data into a spreadsheet to becoming true business analysts and helping to make the most critical decisions in a large company, that's jackpot. That, that's the kind of stories you'll see on the website. Hey, Paul's a great guy. He's the type of guy I'd like to work with, I'd like to work for, because he understands the sales channel and what you're supposed to do, and not just copy everybody else in the industry because it's the trendy thing to do. <coughs> he hired these people who really understood the, what the customer's going through and could communicate that with people, and that became his differentiator. And all of a sudden, when your sales force is the differentiator, you're going to win. I've seen this over and over again. Too often I see you know people just hiring the guy who worked for the competitor, comes over, hires all his cronies, and it doesn't work because the sale is different. I wrote about this in my book, Selling in a New Market Space. You don't have to get it. You can get the Maverick Selling Method for free by writing a review, taking a picture of it, emailing it to me at Brian G. Burns 
at me.com and I'll reply back with the full book, if, especially if you're in the complex sale, because that's really my passion and figuring out what to do, which brings me up to what I'm doing now. I've got a course coming out January 1st called Start the Conversation, Get the Meeting. And it, it's both a marketing and a sales course because today I think, you know, the inbound marketing is kind of peaked. Content is kind of peaked. It's really hard to differentiate yourself when everybody's got a blog, everybody's got a YouTube channel, everybody's got a podcast. The problem is unless you're an influencer, unless you, you've got such a huge audience that's separate from just your customers, you want your customers, but you want new customers, that, that it's just not working anymore. And the cold calling and the cold email isn't working. Social is kind of overdone. What I came up with is a, a baby step approach to get engaged with your target audience. Find out who they are, what they care about, and not pitch them. Not pitch them. Engage with them. Have a conversation with them. And that's what I'm going to be doing starting January 1st. Now, I've partnered up with a handful of vendors, AI vendors, social media vendors, and automation vendors to package it all together. And it's going to come out. And it's going to be very limited. Just a handful of people is going to go to beta for about uh, probably a month, month and a half. Then it'll be in production uh, probably by March of 2018. Uh, connect up with me on LinkedIn if you're interested and want to get on the, the waiting list. You can do that. Also, check out the show notes, all my partners. I mean, Prezi.com slash Brutal Truth. I talk about them. That's what I'm going to be doing all the presentations in. It's so much easier to communicate. Just check it out. Check out their YouTube channel just to see how it works. You can get up and running in 20 minutes. It's that simple. It's cloud-based presentation software. It's really, really easy to use. Also, Pipedrive.com slash Brian. You get the best deal, a free trial, and today they have email notifications. So when someone opens your email, it tells you when. If they click on a link in your email, it tells you when they did that. So you know when they're engaging. And if they're not engaging, so you can get a sense of what to do next. Also, Nudge.ai, they came out with a great new ebook on how people make buying decisions. And this was really spurred my need or the, the development of this class because no one is doing it. Everyone is teaching the same old thing. Oh, oh, and I hear them on other podcasts. Just come up with a better pitch. Oh, challenge them. Well, you got to get a conversation started before you can challenge them. You, you got to get a conversation started before you can pitch them. Everyone is bombarded because everyone's taking. You got to do a little bit of give. And we're going to get into that. Make sure you're checking out the Brutal Truth About Sales and Selling podcast. This week I have uh, the CEO of CoVideo on talking about the difference between B players and A players, and it's dramatically different. And I'm, that's really going to be a focus of mine in 2018 is how to get everyone's game up to the next level. Really appreciate you listening. Go back and listen to the old episodes. They're evergreen, listening to C-level people on what they've learned and how they're differentiating themselves. We'll see you next time.